episode 82, The Gibbonites. Welcome to the History of the Bible. In the last episode, we talked about the event of Mount Ebal. As mentioned, when the event happened, it isn't fully known. However, the Israelites had a foothold in Canaan after the Battle of Ai, Battle of Jericho, and possibly a treaty made with the city of Shechem. From here, they would go north and south to wage war against the rest of the nations within the land. When Joshua and the Israelites conquered Ai, along with Bethel, as some scholars believe, they possibly allied with the people of Shechem and destroyed the city of Jericho. It began to cause great fear in the land of Canaan, and there would be two different ways that the people within would handle this fear. In Joshua 9 verses 1 and 2, it says that the kings in the hill country, in the western foothills, and along the entire coast of the Mediterranean Sea, came together to wage war against Joshua and the Israelites. However, there was one city that would handle the situation differently. That would be the city of Gibeon. Before getting into who the Gibeonites were, we'll examine what they did with the Israelites. In Joshua 9 verse 3, it begins the story of the Gibeonites. When the people of Gibeon heard what the Israelites had done to the other cities within the land of Canaan, they were determined to survive. The leaders of Gibeon sent a delegation of men who pretended to be from a distant land. This group of men loaded their donkeys with worn out sacks and old wineskins that were cracked and mended. They put worn sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. The bread was dry and moldy. All this was done to make it look like the delegation had been traveling for some distance. When they reached the camp of Israel, they told Joshua that when they first left, the bread was still hot from the oven. Their wineskins were new, yet now they were cracked. Their clothes and sandals were worn out from the journey. Again, all of this was just a show. They wanted to make it seem that they were from a distant land. The delegation from the city of Gibeon told Joshua and the Israelites that they had heard about the God of Israel and all that he had done for them from the time of them being in and then leaving Egypt to the conquering of the two kings on the east side of the Jordan River. It was because of this fame that the elders of their city sent them from their distant country. The Israelites only questioned their story once. When the Israelites heard their story and saw that their clothes and belongings that were worn out, Joshua and the Israelites believed them. They were convinced that these men were sent from a far off country to make peace with Israel. So that is what Joshua and the Israelites did. They made a peace treaty with them to let them live. However, because they did not inquire of the Lord, this would come back on them. When the treaty was made, the Israelites' leaders of the assembly ratified it with an oath. It wasn't until three days later that the true identity of the Gibbonites was made known. When the Israelites found out that the Gibbonites were not from a far off country, but rather they were neighbors of the cities they had already destroyed, I and Jericho. So when the Israelites found out about them living within the land of Canaan, they complained against the leaders because of the treaty that they had made. However, the treaty was not broken. In Joshua 9, verse 19, it says, we have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them. Verse 20 would continue to state that the Israelites would let them live so that God's wrath would not fall on Israel for breaking the oath that was sworn to them. What's interesting is that though God wanted them to be destroyed 
because they were within the land of Canaan, the Israelites made a treaty without the consent of the Lord. The Israelites were not willing to break the treaty out of fear of God's wrath. During this period of history, treaties were often made and they would often take the form of either two different types. Either it was a treaty between two equal groups of people, or it was made between one that was stronger and the other that was a weaker people group. In the case of the Gibeonites and the Israelites, it would have been the treaty that was between a more powerful and a lesser state. This type of peace treaty is called a Sozeran Vessel Treaty. The Sozeran referred to the more powerful state in the treaty, and the vessel referred to those who pledge obedience to the more powerful party. These type of treaties have been found throughout all of the Middle East, especially from the Hittite archives. The reason that this type of treaty and the wrath of God would come upon the Israelites if they broke their oath is what is written in the treaty itself. Yes, it does talk about the lesser state pledging obedience and loyalty to the stronger people group, but it also talks about the people's deities. In this treaty that was made between the Israelites and the Gibeonites, there would have been a call upon each party's deity to bear witness against their people, meaning that each party would pledge to their own god or gods that they would uphold the terms of the agreement, otherwise they would receive the wrath of their own god upon themselves. So even though the Lord commanded the Israelites to destroy all the nations within the land of Canaan, the agreement and treaties that the Israelites made, the Lord still honored and upheld. The other side of the Lord upholding the treaty that the Israelites made was because the treaties were made with the people's deities as being a witness and the ones to bring judgment if broken. So, if the Israelites were to break the agreement, it would just show how much the people truly valued their words or oath that was given in the name of their deity, rendering it worthless to the people if the oath was broken. The Israelites upheld the treaty. However, they would make the Gibeonites servants, as it says in Joshua 9 verse 21, that they let them live, but they would be woodcutters and water gatherers in service to the whole assembly of Israel. When we're talking about the Gibeonites, we aren't talking about a single city that was smaller like I. Rather, it says in Joshua 9 verse 17 that it was a league of four different cities that were allied together. Gibeon was just a central city of power of the four cities. In reality, these four cities are all Hivite people, so they were all the descendants of the same people group. They were just referred to as the Gibeonites because they were from the city of Gibeon, which was the main city of the four. As for the inhabitants of these four cities, Hivites, they were the descendants of the Canaanites. This section of the Canaanites, the Hivite tribes, would originally come from the Indo-Europe area near modern-day eastern Turkey around the city of Anatolia. Joshua 10 verse 2, it says that the men of the city were all warriors and that the city itself was greater than the city of Ai, which Joshua and the Israelites just conquered. Now that the Israelites have made a peace treaty with the four cities, as far as we know for sure, within the land of Canaan, Joshua would confront them on their deception to the Israelites. In Joshua 9 verses 22 through 25, Joshua comes to the people of Gibeon and asks them why they deceived them, because now they were to be cursed and that they would always be woodcutters and water gatherers for the house of the Lord. The Gibeonites would reply to Joshua, 
by saying that they had heard that the Lord, the God of the Israelites, had told Moses to give the whole land to Joshua, and that all the inhabitants within the land were to be wiped out. How the Gibeonites had heard about the command that the Lord gave to Moses and then would pass on to Joshua isn't known. However, because of that, they feared for their lives so much so that they would place themselves into servitude to the Israelites. As mentioned, it says that Joshua would allow the Gibeonites to live. However, they would become woodcutters and water gatherers for the house of the Lord, or for the altar of the Lord, as some translations say. What is interesting is the site of Shiloh was only 15 miles north of the region where the Gibeonites live. What is significant about the site of Shiloh is that it would become the place where the tabernacle would set up for over 300 years. Because of its central location to all the tribes when the land was distributed, it was perfect for the place of worship where all of Israel would gather. It also could have been that because the Israelites now had four cities, all part of the Gibeonites, who served as woodcutters and water gatherers, they would be used in the tabernacle. The altar had to be continually burning for all the offerings and the incense that was burnt. Plus, the water would be used to help clean the sanctuary, as it would eventually have blood running from the altar. Thus, the people from the region of Gibeon would become part of the lower status within society, as they were slaves to the Israelites. The results of the treaty would last for generations to come, well into the time of kings reigning over Israel. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. However, just know that Shiloh would continue to be part of Israel's history as it was the center of the land of Canaan. So when the nearby kings heard of the treaty between the Israelites and the Gibeonites, they joined forces. It says in Joshua 10 verses 1 and 2 that when the king of Jerusalem heard about the alliance between Gibeon and Israel, it caused him great fear because the men of Gibeon were great warriors. Some scholars believe that the four cities of the Gibeonites were all vessel states under the authority of the king of Jerusalem. Now, when we are talking about city-states here, it isn't what we think today in modern times. During the time of Joshua and the Israelites, the city-states were broken up into ethnic groups, tribes, cities of residence, or geographic locations. City-states being described based on a political territory would not be a thing until the monarchy was established. More often than not, the only reason that city-states within the land of Canaan would come together was to face a foe that was larger than a single city could defeat. This would then bring about the question, if most city-states, tribes, and people groups acted independently of each other during this period in history, why would the tribes of Israel all be united? This is debated by many scholars. However, it has been believed that the Israelites, even the term Israelites, is looked at because it really should say the tribes of Israel. They came together and stayed united because of a shared background, the same ethnic affiliation, and a common religion, the worship of Yahweh. As we've already talked about before, the four cities of the Gibeon region are believed to be vessel states of Jerusalem as they were all close in proximity to each other. That is why it is believed when it says in Joshua 10 verse 2 that the king of Jerusalem was alarmed or feared that the treaty had been made. Plus, the Gibeonites were great warriors. In order to prepare for the new alliance between Gibeon and Israel, the king of Jerusalem would form his own alliance so that he could attack Gibeon. As a side note, 
This isn't the first time that we have talked about the city of Jerusalem. The first time was when Abraham lived in the land and he and all of his servants went and rescued his nephew Lot and his family from the five armies. When Abraham came back from the battle, he gave a tithe of all the spoils of the battle to the king of Jerusalem. His name was Melchizedek, which means Lord of Righteousness. During the time of Joshua and the conquest of the land of Canaan, the current king over Jerusalem has a very similar name, Adoni Zedek, which means King of Righteousness. So the king of Jerusalem, Adoni Zedek, reached out to the four other city-states and asked for help in attacking Gibeon. It was never meant to be an attack on the Israelites, but only on the Gibeonites. The alliance between Jerusalem and the four cities were all Amorites, which often referred to a branch of the descendants of Canaan that inhabited the hill country of the land of Canaan. When the king of Jerusalem reached out to the other four city-states, all within 20 miles of Jerusalem, it was the only biblical record of letters that were sent between two Canaanite kings. Although it was the only biblical record, other external biblical records of letters have been sent between the Canaanite kings show that in the extra-biblical and biblical records, they were all written the same. In Joshua 10, verse 4, the king of Jerusalem writes, Come up and help me attack Gibeon, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Though it is a simple clip of the letter that would have been written, its style is seen to have parallels to other ancient letters sent and received by the Canaanites. These five Amorite kings would come up against the region of Gibeon. As the treaty allowed for, the Gibeonites sent and requested Joshua to come and protect the people of Gibeon from the five Amorite kings. In chapter 10, verse 6, it says that the Gibeonites sent word to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. Joshua would rally his troops, and they would make the march from Gilgal to Gibeon during the night. This would have been an uphill march of about 15 miles, 24 kilometers. Because Joshua and the men of war, as it calls them in verse 7, marched all night, and in the morning they attacked the five Amorite kings, It caused a panic among the kings. Not expecting to see the Israelites there, they were beaten by Israel at Gibeon. When the Israelites attacked and routed the five Amorite kings, they began to run back to their home cities. Thus, the Israelites would pursue them from the city of Gibeon all the way to Beth Haran. The distance between Gibeon and Beth Haran would be about five miles, or seven kilometers. When the kings and their armies arrived at Beth Haran, they would continue running towards Azika and Makeda, which would be around 15 to 20 miles away. It would be all along the roads that the Israelites would pursue the armies and kill them. However, it was during the pursuit between Beth Haran and Azika that the Lord, as it says in Joshua 10 verse 11, would send large hailstones to rain down into the fleeing armies. It says that more soldiers would be killed by the hailstones that the Lord sent than by the hands of the Israelites. So what were the hailstones? They were just that, hail. Giant balls of ice falling from the sky that would then strike the fleeing army. It might be hard to believe that hail would cause more death than the Israelites pursuing them with their swords in hand. However, today, hail has been recorded to be as big as 7.7 inches in diameter, or about 19 centimeters. And to give a little bit about how hail is created, when water droplets get super cooled within a thunderstorm, when an updraft happens, 
The updraft wind pushes the water droplets higher in altitude, which causes it to freeze. The frozen water droplets will stay in the air until it becomes too heavy and then falls to the ground. What causes the hailstones to grow in size is that the water droplets will continue doing cycles of having more water droplets being frozen to each other. And the stronger the wind, the longer the hail will stay in the atmosphere. So during the time that Joshua was pursuing the Amorite kings, there must have been a large thunderstorm that was happening to cause hailstones to fall from the sky that would be large enough to kill soldiers in battle attire. For the time being, we're going to stop here. Although the battle is still waging between the Israelites and the five Amorite kings, there's an event that will happen during the battle that will take the next episode to dive into. So join us next time in episode 83, When the Sun Stands Still. Until next time, remember that you are loved, special, and worthwhile. Thanks for listening to the History of the Bible. Let's get the word out by liking, rating, and following the show. This episode was produced by Nikeo Productions. To check out other shows, search for Nikeo Productions wherever you listen to podcasts.